Hello, everyone, and welcome to our lunch talk on AI accountability, a comparison of methods. Um, I'm here with my friend and colleague, Professor Finale Doshi Velez, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about a project that we started working on uh, four and a half years ago, I guess. Yeah, it's been a while. Um, and kind of where that has taken us now in terms of thinking about how to implement methods of holding algorithmic decision making accountable, uh, both from kind of the technical end um, and uh, also from the, the legal or policy end. Um, uh, it's going to be a fairly informal um, structure. This is a conversation starting out between the two of us and then hopefully uh, pretty, pretty quickly looping in uh, everyone here in the audience. Um, so we thought we'd just start with some quick introductions. Uh, my name is Mason Quartz. I'm a clinical instructor at the Harvard Law School Cyber Law Clinic, where I spend most of my time supervising students who are working on issues of the intersection of law, policy, and technology. Um, and I will pass it to Finale for introductions. Yeah, so I'm Finale Doshi Velas. I'm at the computer science department at Harvard. And my lab mostly focuses on probabilistic models and decision-making applied to healthcare. Uh, but as part of that, we also focus a lot on accountability in general and explainability and interpretability in particular, which is the thing that brought us together um, for our initial collaboration. Yeah, so uh, Benali, do you wanna start by maybe kind of expanding a little bit on why you got interested in, uh, in this issue of explainability and kind of where, I don't know, where we as a group were at uh, when we started this? Yeah, so I, I mean, I, so I, as I mentioned, I work on healthcare applications and here um, it, was, it was just so abundantly clear as soon as I started working in this space that the, the data are really messy. We can get all sorts of quantitative measures of how well the system seems to be performing, but you know, if we've never measured important factors about a patient, like how easy is it for them to get to the health system or something like this, then we can actually build tools that don't serve populations very well. Um, and so that was my initial kind of like, oh my, we need to understand what these algorithms are doing, especially in certain situations, or it's one tool as part of the toolkit. Um, and then around this time also uh, with GDPR, there was some debate about whether there should be a right to explanation from algorithmic systems. Um, which I thought was a was an intriguing idea where maybe sometimes there should be, maybe sometimes there shouldn't be. And, and that was kind of the um, impetus for this working group on what is the role of explanation when it comes to accountability in AI. Yeah. Um, and, and I think I came in uh, from a from a related, although distinct perspective, you know, uh, I have a little bit of experience in the distant past as a software developer, but mo you know, for the last 10 years I've been focusing on the law. Um, and, you know, my interest coming in here uh, was also sparked by the GDPR, uh, partially about the, the right to explanation, but also this discussion that this, there was this one sentence in there that sparked this huge discussion around AI personhood. Um, yes. And, you know, really trying to disentangle, um, you know, this idea that automated decision makers could and should be governed the same way that human decision makers were. And I was really interested in exploring different methods of accountability and explainability was one that really jumped out to me because it fits so well into many of our existing legal structures where, um, you know, although there are in the US and around the world legal, legal regimes where something is decided purely based on outcome, often uh, the explanation, the how is, is a very important question as much as the sort of the end result. And so it was really interesting to work with a group of computer scientists, lawyers, policymakers, um, on seeing where the where the similarities and where the differences were in the sort of technical role of explainability, um, and then from, coming from my side, the uh, sort of uh, policy or legal role of explainability. And, um, and that's basically where we got to. I feel like you know this uh, this point uh, from that working group was that uh, you know we can demand pretty much similar things of. Uh, algorithms as we can demand it of people. And maybe that's a good starting point because it doesn't mean we're asking a lot more of algorithms, but we're also not letting people kind of hide behind the algorithm by saying that, hey, the algorithm can't do this. So, um, you know, it, you know uh, all of that legal accountability mechanisms go out the window. Um, 
did, did you want to add to that in terms of the kind of what came out of the report? I'm really curious to kind of that, that's what we were thinking then. You know, that was roughly where we were then. Yeah. Where we are now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, that's where we ended up was, you know, drawing these connections and saying that, you know, explanations are, are such an important tool in how we govern systems generally, like putting aside automated decision making when we think about governing from the level of the individual to you know, huge multinational corporations were often focused on explanations. And you know, uh, if we have kind of human systems, you know, both at small and large scale, like can we extend extend that to automated systems? Um, and I think you, I think you know, Fernando, you hit the nail on the head when you said it's a it's a really good starting point. Um, and I think that is where kind of my starting point was, uh, you know, four years ago. But a lot has. You know, Absolutely. I've learned a lot since then. Yeah. The, di the discussion has evolved a lot. And, um, you know, there is a lot going on, you know, if we kind of shift from the past to the, you know, to the present, like where my thinking is now, you know, is about thinking of different forms of uh, accountability, you know, you call, call them different forms of transparency or auditability. Um, as different tools, right? Mm -hmm. And that's both tech, you know, technical tools and legal tools that's and right. you know, different combinations of them, uh, you know, and I think, you know, from the legal side, uh, you know, we kind of break things down into uh, elements, right, of, of, a, of a cause of action. So we say, well, should this have an element of intent? Should it matter whether you were trying to do something good and maybe you ended up harm, harming someone or should it only focus on the injury, right? Should it be, if you caused harm, you caused harm, your responsibility, yeah. you're responsible for it doesn't matter, your intent. Um, is intent the same as knowledge, right? If you were intending something good, but you should have known that it was gonna cause something bad, like what's the level at which we hold someone responsibility? So, you know, pulling these traditional pieces of the legal system of, you know, intent, knowledge, negligence, recklessness, um, as well as different kinds of harms, right? One of the things that's been really tricky about piecing these, trying to piece together new forms of governance from, from kind of like, you know, well, it's around Halloween, but like Frankensteining together, right? New forms of government governance um, is that sometimes there's not great analogies to make, right? Like, so, um, you know, the law has traditionally been very focused on tangible, even physical injuries, and sometimes, you know, purely monetary injuries, but you know, there's a huge debate right now over like whether just having your date, your personal information mishandled is in itself an injury, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of from the legal end, the sort of taxonomy or grouping of tools that I've been thinking about. And I'd, I'd love to hear from the, uh, from the engineering side, what that looks like. Yeah, and uh, I, I loved how when we were chatting earlier, you were talking about how at the legal end, you, you can kind of map these different elements that you talked about to the inputs that go into the system, the system itself, whatever process that happens, and um, the, the output of the system, like did it actually cause some harm or something like that. And in terms of different technical mechanisms, I think that they kind of fit into those three buckets as well. Um, that when it comes to um, accountability, we first have to check whether the inputs are clean or appropriate. And there's like a, the transparency is such an important aspect there that the Data Nutrition Project, um, you know, through Assembly and Berkman is doing some really great work along these lines of just like, because the data is garbage in, garbage out, right? Like you kind of need to know what's going into your system or, you know, maybe it's not garbage, but maybe it's just not people who look like me or something like this. And maybe the system's not gonna work for a certain population. You should just know, right? Before, you don't even need to know the algorithm. Um, and then the explainability, I feel like really fits into the, 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 the system itself, the how, right? That sometimes you kind of care about the in, intent of the process of, you know, what did, did what, 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 how was it connecting the dots and where was it connecting the dots in a reasonable way? Um, and then there's a variety of mechanisms to check the outcomes. Um, and that's kind of your quantitative traditional performance measures around accuracy and fairness and all of these sorts of things. Um, and I think it's also really important to note that these can be applied either uh, or that not either and <laughs> they should be applied both um, prior to the system being deployed out in the world ex ante um, and then also monitoring afterwards is really really important because things shift like maybe the population that you trained on looked like something but like for example in a healthcare scenario 
uh, you know, hospital changes their policies on, you know, when tests are given, their protocols, the, you know, best practices change, and all of a sudden your system can't deal with um, data being collected in a different way or by a different machine or something like that. Yeah, I almost visualize that taxonomy as um, kind of like a two by three matrix, right? Yes. So you have you have ex ante and ex post, and then you have the three categories of inputs, process, and outputs. And I think it's it's really worthwhile developing tools and techniques for each of those you know six boxes. But what strikes me is that the legal system is very spread out across those, and it's not very consistent, right? So there are circumstances where the legal system is essentially only concerned with say like ex post uh, output analysis, right? So it's like, you just measure the harm caused and if it exceeds mm -hmm. a certain threshold, there's yeah, like- You wait for the harm to happen. <laughs> so, well, the, the legal system is very focused on waiting for the harm to exactly. happen, which is, which, is, which is one of the really, you know, difficult issues with, you know, any sort of, um, well, any, any sort of regulation, but especially in technology regulation is like getting out ahead of problems, right? It's often mm -hmm. not just that you wait for the harm to happen, but then you wait for it to happen for the, to like the, the specific person who has the time and interest and resources to bring the case and adjudicate it. Um, you know, and ideally we have other branches of government that are meant to be more proactive, um, but those seem to be a little tied up with political things uh, these days. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, I think it's really, it's really helpful to have, to look at like the strengths and weaknesses of both the technical side and the policy side of the regulation and maybe see where some, especially the technology will be able to shore up some of the weaknesses in the, um, uh, in the policy side of what we regulate. Yeah, I, I do think there's definitely things that technology could do. Um, that said, one, one other bit that has changed for me in the last several years is that when we originally wrote our, um, our white paper had our working group having to do with explanation, um, and the law, I, I think that a lot of explanation mechanisms seem relatively doable at the time. Like, you know, it's like, oh, okay, I, I could see how some certain things we calculated. And uh, as we've seen over the last couple of years, I, I think that my view has definitely shifted towards it to the extent that you can have models that are fully inspectable by humans. Um, you, you should, because, uh, there are so many ways in which uh, explanations, explanations that just to provide a broader view for, for folks who are listening. Um, when I use the term explanation, I'm thinking you get a partial view of the system. And, and this might be quite reasonable because when we ask people, you know, why did you do this or, um, you know, uh, something like that, we are not asking for every bit of their, you know, brain cells and what, what's going on. We, we are asking for some summary of, that's relevant to the question. Um, it, so it, it seemed very reasonable to say that, hey, you don't need to know everything that's going on in a complicated system. Let's ask for the explanation for the relevant portion. Um, the, the trickiness comes in is that systems are, you know, machines are, will do exactly what you tell them to do. And so one thing that we've noticed over the past couple of years is that let's suppose that um, you're building a system uh, that's supposed to provide an explanation over like how features were used to come to an outcome. Um, and you know that certain features should not be used in certain ways. Like let's say that uh, uh, you're, you're making loan recommendations and you know that you can't be biased uh, with respect to race or something like that or gender. Uh, so you tell the system to not be by that, that, that you cannot do this, right? Um, and the way we're going to say you cannot do this is that when we ask for any individual and you ask for the key features, like it better not be the case that the key feature is somebody's gender or somebody's race, um, that would be bad. Um, and, and then it, with no additional malicious intent or something, in, in fact, this is with good intent, you're trying to build the system so that it doesn't have this property. Um, these models can be so flexible that they kind of push the bubble in the wallpaper somewhere else and say, oh, well, if you're measuring, you know, relevant feature in this really specific way, then, okay, I'll build it. So it doesn't, that, that part is okay, <laughs> but it still could be dependent in another way. Um, and, and because you never ask the question, the system never um, reveals that part of itself. So, I think that another piece that has kind of changed for me is that I still believe that the role of explanation is really 
important, but you definitely need experts involved, you know, kind of getting back to the legal and policy side. It's not something that you can just say like, oh, just go and do it because um, it may not give you what you want. Yeah, and I, and I think for me, one of the big things that's evolved, which is also kind of about expanding away from this, the very specific, you know, uh, slice of this that we talked about in our original paper is, you know, I think I, I still find it very interesting, you know, how do we make uh, automated decision making systems that are amenable to legal to regulation, um, mm -hmm. you know, that present enough information to be regulated. Um, but also, I mean, there, so there are a couple of things that, that I've sort of branched out on. One is to think about what are the salient differences between a system that is performs performs lawfully versus a system that performs ethically versus a system that performs in a socially beneficial way, right? Because sometimes those aren't the same thing. No, they're not, yeah. Um, you know, and, it, and, it, and it's especially true that, you know, um, I think that ethics tends to be somewhat of an abstraction of our ideas of social good and law is there is a, is a further level of abstraction from our idea, ideas of what's ethical. And at two levels of abstraction, uh, I think you might, you know, as a, as a, as a CS professor, you might say like, you're getting kind of far away from the yes. original intent. And so it's perfectly possible that we will have systems that perform lawfully, um, but are actually still harmful or vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is very similar to your the bubble in the wallpaper uh, problem here, which is that one of the strengths we talk about um, with, um, with uh, machine learning and with uh, automated decision making is that well, they hopefully are designed to find creative ways, um, quick creative ways around um, creative solutions to new problems, right? But sometimes they're a little too creative, right? Which is like, oh, well, you know, we'll just, uh, you know, we can't use race. So, and we, you know, we, and we can't use first order proxy variables like zip code, but, you know, if we can find something like someone's favorite football team, you know, maybe we can like find a connection to that. Um, you know, so sometimes that creative creativity can come around and, and really bite us, even though at that point you're operating in what is legally a clear zone, uh, you know, it might be exactly. especially harmful. Yes, 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 yes. Um, I, I see that there's a couple of questions that are kind of directly related to what we're just saying that have come in. Um, so just to clarify, um, I, I, th that was just an example of a situation, you know, where we, so the question was like, aren't there some situations where it's a good idea to include race uh, to, to um, address historical inequities? Absolutely. The, the, this was more of a question of like, if, if the law says, or the regulation says that you shouldn't use this, um, and you try to create a system that doesn't use it by, you know, enforcing a certain property on the explanations, it might not do what you want. So kind of the Trying to get at the fact that some sometimes there's there's some technical subtleties um, over here, um, and we've we've absolutely uh, you know it, it, explanation is also geared to the to the user right. So it might be for a domain expert, like we're trying to communicate with clinicians, uh, or it might be for a for an everyday uh, user. Um, it, the the first question that's there, I think, maybe leads into where we think things might want to go in the future. Which is, uh, is it reasonable to expect um, that should there be explainability requirements everywhere or for the most high risk systems? And maybe I'll expand that question to be just like, where do we want this to go or where do we think that this should go in the near term? Yeah. And I think, um, you know, as always, there's sort of the in an ideal world, where do I want this to go? And, you know, sort of within the operating constraints of reality, where do I want this to go? Um, so I think that th there are, uh, there, you know, uh, regulation can be uh, approached from kind of multiple axes, right? So one option is to focus on uh, regulation around automated decision-making specifically and require certain, um, you know, certain uh, measures of accountability. And, you know, based on the discussion we were just having, you know, I think that one possibility there is to, uh, provide um, multiple, uh, either multiple redundant or at least options of different ways of achieving accountability. So, you know, uh, it, it would be possible to say that all, um, you know, all systems, all automated decision systems must be capable of producing 
you know, human understandable explanations that are readable by a reasonable expert in the field or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, you could also imagine a system where you're given, you know, developers are given the option of doing that or submitting detailed audit data or, you know, uh, or sticking to a, a limit of, you know, kind of pre-cleared inputs, right? So it's sort of like, if you use this pre-cleared set of inputs, you're okay. Um, but if you want to deviate from that, then you need to have, like satisfy an explainability requirement and or submit to annual audits on your outputs or something like that. Um, and I'm not saying that that is necessarily like the best option, but like one we could imagine. The, and I think of that as sort of like a, a horizontal integration, right? Um, you know, so saying that there are these multiple ways to address that. Then there's like a sort of vertical integration, which is kind of forget a little bit about, are we talking about automated decision-making or not, but just focus on regulating the harms, right? So, mm. so this would be the approach that some, a lot of people are advocating in things like housing allocation, right? Which is, we shouldn't really, uh, what we should do is focus more on impact and yeah. say, you know, if a human's making the decision, if an algorithm is making the decision, the question is, are we increasing or decreasing housing disparity, right? That's what we should be focusing on, right? We should be focusing on outcomes and less on methods. I imagine that um, for practical reasons, we will probably see intersections of those. I think if you focus mm -hmm. too much on methods, you end up by the time the regulation gets passed, it's already outdated. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. If you focus too much on outcomes, the problem is then uh, traditionally what has happened there is, you know, you set an outcome-based rule, but then there's all these edge cases. And before you know, the edge cases have eaten up the intent of the original rule. Um, so that's kind of what I foresee for the future, uh, which is maybe I guess less than an answer about what I want, what as I see as like potential paths forward. So, right, yeah. right, right. And, and maybe uh, an important piece is just, I think that specific, like creating those, those detailed checklists is hard because regulation and legislation moves very slowly and you want things described at a, a high enough level that um, you know, it's gonna stay relevant and there's not gonna have uh, these loopholes or, or these sorts of things. I think the biggest thing for me is uh, transparency uh, around like that. I mean, there, there's a set of situations where I think you have to have certain types of requirements and certain types of high stakes and safety critical domains. You need reporting requirements around how the system is performing over time. Um, you need to have some, you know, just like there's a current FDA approval process for devices, you need to be able to demonstrate certain things about your, your product before you, you put it onto the market. Uh, and then maybe in other cases, at, at the very minimum, and I'm emphasizing this is the minimum, this is not where we you know, get to, there needs to be a way that the buyer can at least be aware. Um, you know, that, what we, so that, that includes not only just transparency around the, the input data, which I mentioned earlier, but transparency around you know, what sort of accountability checks have been done or are being done for this system. You know, we have checked on these populations and have this level of performance. Um, we have checked to see, you know, we, we, we can expose certain parts of the model to you and you can look at it. And there might be multiple ways, as you're saying, but at least transparency about what has been done um, can help people at least start, be, again, a starting point to make some sort of informed decisions um, and, and the reason I mentioned that is that I, I think that it's so hard to get systems to move. Um, and this was a question that was asked prior, you know, like, why is this hard to implement? But this sort of transparency maybe can become the gold star, right? Like, oh, we're a good company because we make all of these things available about our products or something like that. And at least maybe you can get some traction that way. Yeah, I think, you know, um, certainly like, be you know, absolutely helpful to keep in mind that like uh fortunately i think one of the better developments we've seen in sort of the tech sphere in the last 10 years is more people individually getting concerns about concerned about things like privacy security fairness and and and, and working on those um one thing one thing that kind of made me think of um uh that i just wanted to mention really quick is, you know, it, it actually reminds me a little bit of the structure of the Voting Rights Act back when it was whole, um, you know, and not in its current gutted form where there were multiple layers of accountability, right? So there were 
certain regions that were considered kind of high risk, essentially, because of a tradition, a, you know, a, a history of voter suppression and discrimination, where if they wanted to make certain changes, pre-clearance was required. Mm-hmm. In other areas, you, you could make changes without pre-clearance, but there was still an ex post cause of action to challenge those, right? And I can imagine a, a similar tiered structure for regulating yeah. automated decision-making where depending on um, both the history of that particular in- industry and maybe the foreseeable harm, you know, we might say, we might, we, I think we could reasonably imagine a system of regulation where the degree of pre-clearance required yeah. to change, you know, uh, a music recommendation algorithm is very different than the degree of pre- uh, pre-clearance for a medical algorithm. Right, right. You can, and, and those bins, I think, are absolutely creatable, right? So you could, you know, from a regulatory standpoint, you could create those bins, and then there's a question of figuring out where where a system sits, and maybe, uh, you know, after some period of time, you realize that maybe the system needs to be in a different bin, and you can move it over. Um, as you get a better sense of what harms are possible um, with that particular application. Um, well, I see we're, we're about halfway yeah. through and we, yeah. have and we have lots of questions. Lots of great questions. Do you want to pick one and, and run with it? Sure. Um, so let's see. I, I'm, I'm going to just uh, start by looking at the top. Um, so I, I think the first one we kind of addressed, which is asking about, um, do we design them for, you know, domain experts? I think it's, I mean, it, it, explainability is for for whoever is trying to to use the system. Um, and then uh, the next uh, the next question has to do with um, are time tools like Lime or Shap? I'll take this one because it's a technical question. Sufficient for types of legal and policy requirements? And the answer is no, <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> um, and and the reason why is exactly the sort of thing that I mentioned um, earlier. Because like if you have so for those of you who are not familiar, Lime and Shap are specific ways to determine you know, what features are important for a particular decision. And they, they're computed differently and they'll give you different answers actually because they, they just compute different things. So that's already kind of a, you know, depending on the application, one of them might be more relevant um, than the other. And uh, it, they have this problem that if you, if you train a system uh, that uh, is supposed to be, have a certain type of Lime output or a certain type of SHAP output, um, it can do that, but um, I'm trying to think what's a what's a simple example that's kind of broadly explainable. Here's a, here's an example. Let's say so. Lime the way Lime works um, is it kind of looks at the local region around a particular point. So it says that he, here you are, and here are your neighbors, and let's try to see like what does a decision boundary look like in just this area, right, uh, with you and your neighbors. And so let's say the boundary looks like this: that everyone on this side likes cats, and this everyone looks, uh, likes dogs. That's what the model thinks. Um, and so it says that, you know, the feature that's most important, you know, in, in terms of separating out this boundary is, you know, your, the size of your yard. I'm just making this up. Um, so it, that, that seems quite reasonable, right? Like, you know, oh, it seems like if you had a bigger yard, maybe I would have thought you'd like a dog um, rather than a cat. Uh, but remember that we're in these really high dimensional spaces. Um, and so the data lies on this very low dimensional, think of it like a sheet of paper in, in 3D space or even worse, you know, that the, the data are very thin structure in, in this very high dimensional space. So when you say look around, there's a thin paper, you know, data lies here, and then there's around, there's nothingness, right? And you can fill the nothingness with whatever you want to make the system look like it's being fair in a particular way or not, depending on a particular feature. So that's slightly technical. Um, but just trying to understand um, why like these, these sorts of tools are not really sufficient. Um, that's not to say that there aren't ways to extract the information that we want to extract, but it's kind of the importance of having a, an expert perhaps be part of that, that process. Um, the next question is one I think we should, we should both take a stab at answering, which yeah. is, uh, do we think that there are areas where automated decision systems should just be off limits, like no go zones? Um, so I'll start out, I'll say, I mean, as a philosophical matter, I could probably make an argument that there's some configuration where automated decision making is permissible in almost any area. But as a practical matter right now, yes, I, I do think that that is the case. And I think there are, you know, um, you know, there are qualities to look at in terms of where we should 
just not be experimenting, right? So one issue is what's the degree of harm that can be caused if there an error, if there's mm -hmm. an error. Um, two, what's the degree of consent involved, right? So if it's an area where people are really knowing, fully knowingly opting in to using an automated decision-making system and they have a good alternative, that concerns me a lot less than if it is being thrust upon them. Yeah. Um, you know, and I would say, um, uh, you know, the, the, the third one is um, whether, uh, how amenable or how amenable it is to redress, you know, through current systems we have, whether that's, you know, through the law or even reputational versus how much does it allow people to evade traditional responsibility? So I worry about those cases that seem to diffuse responsibility and make it really hard to, to hold anyone liable. So I'll give an example, uh, you know, so one, one area that is, um, you know, high risk and largely non-consensual is use of uh, uh, automated decision-making anywhere in the criminal legal system. Like that really worries me because that is not something people are opting into. It's something that, you know, people, can you know have their freedom taken away in some in some jurisdictions they can have their life taken away uh so that really worries me right it really has the opportunity to magnify existing inequities there as well um and redress is hard to get in yeah. like even even with tradi even traditionally like trying to iron out the problems in, in our legal system their criminal legal system is hard on the other hand you might have something like using um you know if if, if an individual wants to you know, gamble on using an automated decision making to make stock recommendations, right? That's very risky, um, mm -hmm. but it also can be fully consensual. I wouldn't want a mutual fund doing that without consulting with everyone. But if yeah. you want to use that program individually and try to, you know, shoot your shot, so to speak, um, then, um, you know, I have, I, I'm less concerned about that, even though it's high risk, it's consensual. Yeah. Um, and I do think, you know, that's kind of where we get into a gray area also about like account, you know, holding accountability. I do think that might be a place where purely harm-based accountability, like if you fail, fail to disclose and you lose money, like that's it, you're liable. It doesn't matter how much money you intended to make. Um, you know, so those are kind of factors that go into my thinking about where we're, where, where, where we're, where it's safe, where it's kind of safe with, you know, you know, maybe some extra regulation and where we're just not ready to go yet. Yeah, I, I think that's a great taxonomy of, of features. And uh, I, I, I'll just add um, from a technical perspective, there are some types of problems that are just very hard to specify and then end up having all of the properties that you mentioned. Um, so, so not only do they involve kind of perhaps lack of consent uh, or insufficient opportunity for redress and all of the, and, and our high stakes and all of these things, um, but they're also just poorly defined, right? <laughs> like, um, it, and machines are not good at thinking about questions that are poorly defined. So like in the criminal justice system, um, you end up with, with, with things that aren't just a number, right? That you're trying, that, that's the whole point. You know, these are human beings that you're trying to reason about a lot of different issues at stake. Um, and uh, I think that's where like machines are not great. And then machines that are not gonna be great um, in settings that have all of the properties that you mentioned, it's just a recipe for you know, things going badly. Yeah, yeah. I think it's uh, that's another interesting area where the technical challenges and the legal challenges line up. Um, next question, also really interesting. Is it possible or, and or desirable to institute something like Asimov's three laws of robotics for AI? Do we need an AI police force? Um, well, naturally, as a lawyer, um, my response is why stop at three? Um, <laughs> um, but no, I do think that, um, I think that, you know, just based on my experience with the legal system is oftentimes it's, you know, it's easy to see, to state like a general principle but then as you dig into it, you find more and more edge cases, uh, more and more lack of clarity. I worry about um, something as simple as three laws of robotics would quickly yeah. either get swallowed up by exceptions or it would take so long to hash out, uh, you know, in whatever adjudicated body you have um, to figure out what, you know, what are the exact, exact extents? Like, what does it mean to cause harm to a human, right? Is calling a 
human a bad name, like enough of a harm that a robot should self-destruct before doing that? You know, there would be all these uh, questions. So I do think that, um, you know, having, having high level principles is a good place to start. I think the other big problem there is that, uh, you know, we're living like in an increasingly, like almost universally global era. And there are huge amounts of differences about what 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 our social goals should be, what is ethical and what is not ethical. Um, you know whether you know whether even we prioritize uh, individual harms over social benefits. So I think that I think that having these kind of goals is is a noble idea, but I think it's going to require a lot more detailed fine tuning. Yeah, well, I was going to ask you a follow on question. It's you know on the legal side, which is. Uh, there's there's a notion of um, kind of like well we have to figure like in the U.S. things are very sector specific you know how things work in uh, you know for for drugs is different than food is different and then in the EU we have the AI Act that's you know being developed that that isn't the three laws it's you know many more than three <laughs> but it but it's trying to take a much more global approach and I'm, I'm curious what you think it kind of from a legal perspective between these two two different ways of thinking about this. Yeah, well, this kind of goes back to the vertical versus horizontal mm. style of regulation. Um, I, I think that uh, ultimately the, the fact is that either one uh, is gonna require a, a great deal of um, kind of hashing out in case by case analysis. Mm -hmm, um, sure. I, I tend to think that it's actually, uh, I, would, I would be more, I would be more happy with sort of the uh, layered model, right? So the idea of like, if you have both regulations that apply to automated decision-making and regulations that apply to say, the financial sector, the housing sector, mm -hmm. the medical mm -hmm. devices sector, um, rather than choose one or the other, if you have both, you get the best, best coverage, right? It's kind of like aligning to polarized lenses. Right, right, right. Especially when it comes to outcomes that you care about, because sometimes it doesn't matter who the actor is. Like, is it a, a human decision maker or a automated decision maker? The, the value is, say, housing equity or something like mm -hmm. this that you're trying to get to. Exactly. And, and that has to be specified by people. There can't be a law that says, like, you know, machines must support housing equity. It doesn't really make sense. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Um, do you want to jump in on the next question? Yeah, I was just taking a look. So the next question is, my question is about data, which can be biased due to unrepresent, uh, AI can be biased due to unrepresentative data. Um, on the other hand, apparently objective data may replicate current inequalities. Um, and so what could be the solution? I think we we just need to be really aware of what those current inequalities are um, in society, um, so that we don't replicate them. I, I think that that there isn't really a way. Like there there are ways to work with biased data from a technical perspective, but if you don't know that it's biased, then uh, then, then it's not going to work. Um, I also I kind of this isn't quite in the question, but in term from a policy perspective, I think that ways to get sufficient trust uh, and build the right sort of data collaboratives or collectives, so um, people can uh, or people, companies, etc., in the appropriate areas can pool data is is so important because oftentimes um, we're doing worse for populations who need, who could benefit the most, or, you know, who have been systematically discriminated against. Um, and then we just kind of, we, we but, but we don't have the data from those populations. And those populations, you know, justifiably are not particularly excited about sharing <laughs> their data because, you know, it has been used against them. So, how, like, I, I think there is, there, there's some naughty issues here in terms of, like, how do we, um, how do we get truly representative data in it? And, and how do we build the appropriate governance and trust structures so that people are, are willing to contribute? Yeah, I'll add on top of that. I think it's really important to think very critically about what the data actually is. So for example, you know, going back to the, you know, the use of, uh, you know, um, uh, any sort of data analytics really on say um, prime data, like we actually do not have data 
about the commission of crimes. We have data about arrests and we have data about That's prosecutions, right. right? But we mm -hmm. actually can't get data on the commission of crimes, right? Um, if we had 100% perfect reporting on every time a crime was committed, you know, it would, it would be a, would be a very different world. But the kind of like the idea behind crimes is you don't tell people. Um, <laughs> And, you know, so like really like when people talk about criminal data, I'm always like, think about what your what the data actually is, right? You know, and I think that's like the, the step zero in, um, in getting away from biased data. And that's a case where I just, you know, I, with a, with, a, with a handful of very narrow exceptions, I don't think it is possible to unbias that data, right? Because yes, that's you, fair. there's so many of layers of bias between the thing we're trying to measure and the data we have that yeah. there's no there's no backtracking. Right. Yes, like there, there's certain things that machines can do. Like if, if, there, if you need to upweight a certain set of events happening to make sure that they don't happen, you know, it might be a rare event, but it's really important that this like a medical adverse situation and doesn't happen. That's a technical problem you can fix. Um, but if there are too many layers, as you're saying, between what you're measuring and what you want to do, it's just, it's not possible. Yeah. Um, so the next question is, what kind of punishments or incentives for following any policy around these accountability measures would be most useful? Who do you see as having actual resources and skills to enforce any policies that might be passed around AI regulation? Um, that's a that's a that's a really excellent question because uh, you know we can set up like the perfect system of you know transparency and rules and regulations, but if you can ignore them uh, without any uh, you know without any you know ill effects, then you know they're they're basically aspirational. Um, I think right now you know my 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 thoughts on this have changed a lot, and and, and as usual the idea is like well it's a kind of a combination of um, you know kind of yeah, preemptive regulation after the fact, uh, redress uh, through an adjudic adjudicatory body like a court um, and, and social pressure. Right now, I think I feel kind of most bullish on um, things like pre like market preclearance. Right, that I think that there's a large. I think a a lot can be done with requiring. Um, software developers, product developers, to go through certain steps, certain mandatory disclosures. Uh, prior to using using an automated decision making system, both because I think that'll catch some both intentional and unintentional errors, but also those disclosures will set us up well for those cases where you know the system the the process doesn't catch something, but we then need to go and do some sort of after the fact adjustment. And it's such a clear point, right? You like if it's out in the world, it must have this clearance. It, it, yeah. It's just a very it's very black and white that you, you did the thing that you were supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have any other thoughts on that one? No, I I, I really like that because I, I yeah I I think that otherwise it's it's kind of hard. But you know what, in terms of figuring out exactly how to enforce these sorts of you're, you're the expert um, in terms of like how do you get people <laughs> to actually do things? <laughs> I build um, them. <laughs> well, yeah. I, I think the next one is 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 one that you're definitely the expert on because it is uh, about technical implementation. Oh, I see. Um, let's go go to that. Um, of of the existing AI ethics guidelines and frameworks, are there any that make the most sense to implement technically? So, I mean, I think right now that these are really far apart, right? The the specifics of what we implement versus um, the like what what is actually you know the, the the values that are encoded in the guidelines. So I don't think anything is kind of ready for implementation. Um, but I do think that the, there are frameworks that are. Like I was chatting with some folks in the UK, and, and they're definitely thinking very carefully about like what reporting requirements should be uh, there for like medical AI systems and stuff like that. So I think people are people are getting there. Um, and I think there was another uh, question slightly lower down about given that high risk fields are already regulated, would it be better to adapt existing laws to address the harms posed by AI rather than create a new omnibus? AI law, which we kind of already talked about, uh, but it is, I think, a related question of, um, you know, many in many of these areas, there, there are some really, really good notions of, like, if you just put a product out on the market, um, you, you should be making sure that it's monitored in certain ways, and we can adapt that to, to AI systems. 
Yeah, I, I agree with that. And just to reiterate, like I think that in these high risk fields, so, you know, if we really do consider these high risk, um, you know, why not? Why not? Why not both? Right? Yeah. Exactly. Um, yeah. Um, so next question here is for transparency requirements that center on reporting, such as which which of these checks have you done? Um, it seems like it would help to have standards that are generally accepted as legitimate. Any thoughts on how we start building consensus around what form these standards should take? Um, that's a really, I think, a really tough one. You know, coming from the you know kind of the law and policy side of things, uh, even getting consensus around what would be a socially beneficial outcome is is very difficult. So then, th then operationalizing that right into specific recording reporting standards is, is very difficult. But I, I do think um, that you know we can look to existing. Um, impact-based uh, assessments. So, you know, there, there are, we already have some spheres where impact is, is really important, right? So um, in housing, you can bring a disparate impact claim. In environmental law, you have to go through many rounds of impact assessment before you can, you know, implement any um, sort of large-scale project that would have a big environmental impact. Um, so I think that um, looking at what are the kind of shared standards and, and to an extent shared norms that we, mm -hmm. we can derive from existing impact-based um, regulatory standards. Um, I mean, even in uh, you know drug development, right? We have uh, some standards about uh, what, um, what kinds of adverse effects you need to disclose and what is an acceptable level of adverse effects. Um, so and, I think we have- there's, a there's a notion of, um kind of anomaly detection and or uh, uh, anomaly reporting so there, there's kind of the, the, the like many sectors have their lists of like make sure that this chemical is below this level make sure that this adverse event is above you know whatever all of these sorts of things so we we have things to borrow from in in, in, sec, in specific sectors um but there i think another key and I think there is consensus, you know, at least in some of those sectors or around what should be done. Uh, and I think the other key thing is maybe a meta consensus around um, as people report weird things happening, you know, with the system, then there's a there's a process by which that weird thing um, becomes part of the reporting requirement. You know, it's like, oh, loss of smell, maybe that wasn't on our list, but now it's on our list <laughs> for things that we check for or something like that. Because uh, it is going to be a somewhat messy process. So maybe just getting consensus around the meta process is the place to start. Yeah. And I will say for any for, sort of consensus, right? I think a an initial question is among consensus among whom, right? You know, mm -hmm. so for a drug, we might say we want consensus among, uh, you know, kind of experts in that particular field, right? And we maybe don't need national popular unity on, you know, what, what is the level of a significant uh, adverse event. Although I think we want some correlation between the <laughs> official view and the, the general yeah. public view. But I do think there are other areas where consent needs to take in much broader swaths of people, right? You know, um, so I think, you know, that's another, I think, tricky question there is what is the, um, you know, what is the community that that, uh, that that sort of consensus needs to occur in? Um, yeah. yeah. Let's see. Um, so I think we, we kind of addressed the, the next question. Next, the, the one after that is for you. I'll read it out. Is it better to use the lens of international human rights law to assess impacts of automated decision-making tools because of its universal and contextual features, for example, the uh, or that is the right to equality and non-discrimination versus using ethical principles, which are subjective and amorphous, which is fairness. Yeah. Um, so I think that uh, international human rights law is, um, like I was saying before, it is kind of an embodiment, an abstraction of what we look at, what we think of as universal norms. Um, I think that there are some benefits to using international human rights law, which is it's gone through 
a um, it's already gone through a large consensus making process that is not specific to one nation, one culture, you know, where you can imagine, for example, in the US, we're almost we're, we're, we're very far on one side of the extreme in terms of focusing on individual harms, right? And if we were to set individual harm as the standard for what is a good outcome, good or bad outcome with automated decision making, we're really exporting that, you know, that cultural determination anywhere that these systems travel. So I think that one benefit of international human rights law is that um, uh, it does attempt to be universal. I think one of the downsides of it is um, international human rights law is notoriously hard to enforce against actors that have significant amounts of power. I mean, that's, uh, that's true in any sort of adjudicatory system, right? The more money, the more power you have, the more likely you are to escape consequences. Uh, but it seems exacerbated in international rights law to the extent that some people, you know, ask like, is international human rights a, a legal system or is it just a, a, a shorthand for explaining existing power structures? Um, so I think those are kind of, to me, the trade-offs, right? Um, uh, however, I do think that, um, and, and another big question here is that a lot of the development and deployment and harm caused by automated decision makings you know, I, I don't want to understate how, how much harm government misuse can cause, but also private use of these systems can be very harmful. Um, and uh, there's a there's a, a lot of difficulty in bringing private actors under the auspices of, of international human rights law. I think that that is mm -hmm. moving in a good direction in the sense that there is more talk of, you know, large multinational companies with sort of almost quasi uh, governmental powers uh, being at least quasi susceptible to human rights law. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely an area worth exploring. I think that to me, what I, what concerns me is the, the traditional difficulty of enforcement in that area. That makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> so our, our next question is, do you believe accountability should include lost opportunity? Yes, I think that's a simple answer. Yeah, and that, that, that's a major issue that happens. I mean, small scale, like why does my YouTube personalize to like one set of videos, and then and then it's so easy to click click clicking on so you know, and like there there could be a whole world out there, and it's a lost opportunity. No, there, there's really more much more important lost opportunities out there. The personalizing systems that personalize, I, I think this is a big issue. Um, there's a, a lot of losses of, of opportunity where people don't even know what the options, what options they might have had available. They get tracked in a particular way. I, I also think about that in the sense of, you know, not just measuring the problems of, a, of an automated decision making system in an absolute sense, but comparing it to what are we left with if we don't implement it. Right. Yeah, of you course. Know, yeah. Right. You know, and this is, um, you know, we can't, you know, it's, it's really tempting to compare automated, you know, a solution to an ideal world. Right. But if we're comparing mm -hmm. the solution to the existing world, that can change the calculus quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and I, I mean, I think then that comes down to, again, like if you're really focused on impact, that's somewhat easier to measure. Like you can say, like, okay, it shifts the needle, you know, this many points in a direction we like. Um, I find that harder if you're if you're really focused on an intent based system. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I find that those kinds of uh, those kinds of decisions are um, harder to account for. Do a harms benefit analysis when you're when you're looking at uh, you know intent versus impact. Um, so, but again, like it, you know, it, that doesn't mean we should only be looking at impact um, because I think that purely looking at impact a will miss a lot of. Um, potentially solvable problems. And also it doesn't line up well with, you know, everyone's idea of how regulation and enforcement should work. I think a lot of people think that intent is important. Right. I, I, I do think that there, like, there is something that we don't, like a, a loophole often that we often think about, especially when I, when I think about systems in the health space where we're, we often are like, okay, but the, the system, it's it's just a recommendation, right? It's not the actor, right? The doctor is making the decision or maybe with the stock example, um, you know, I'm still making the decision to um, invest in a certain way. 
but in a very real sense, like people turn their brains off, you know, like when you see when, when a system gives a recommendation or maybe places one choice above another choice, um, these are much more subtle versions of, of lost opportunities. Um, uh, there, there's gross ones as well. But I, I really think across the board, there's a, there, 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 this is like a real issue of kind of um, uh, like people, people stop thinking, people stop exploring. Um, we kind of homogenize systems, so we lose kind of um, how we learn new things because we 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 kind of go with. It. And I think it's it, it's a it's not exactly a regulatory question, or a, but it, there is a kind of important piece here um, that that's kind of important to think about. Um, so the next question is. Uh, for the example on stock uh, picking, won't transparency uh, become the norm because of market pressure or user demand instead of government regulation? Obviously, where fairness is an issue, like recidivism or healthcare-related applications, governments need to mandate it due to high risk. Um, I think that uh, I, I do think that market pressure will um, will have will certainly have an impact on how automated decision-making systems get used. One of my concerns with relying too much on market pressure is, and this kind of almost goes back to the sort of the machine learning side of things is, what are we optimizing for, right? So uh, oftentimes market pressure uh, maximizes gross value and not things like value distribution. Uh, you know, so for example, if I can somehow take $10 from 10 different people and turn that into $200, the market sees that as a win. Um, and I probably see that as a win, um, <laughs> but society might not see that as a win. Um, so, um, you know, this is a, um, you know, so this is where I think that um, depending on the area of regulation, what, you know, depending on, sorry, depending on the, 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 the impact and the, and the potential harms, you know, I think if it's, it's more like a, a, a slider, right, between complete, you know, complete heavy handed regulation versus, um, you know, let the market sort it out. And, and for different applications, you're probably at different places in there. Um, you know, for example, you know, so, you know, uh, for example, with stock picking, you know, but I think there are other, you know, questions about whether the market is, you know, in terms of transparency, right? Like, so is it going to provide information that, you um, you know, kind of casual investors can use and understand, or is it really going to, you know, be a, a tool that uh, helps, like, say, large corporations uh, maximize their investments while not helping the person who, you know, has a few, you know, thousand dollars in their retirement fund. So I think there are, you know, there are equity issues there that I wonder about. Yeah, that I mean, when market pressures are there, that's fantastic, but many times they don't always do exactly what we we want them to do. So I'm noticing that we're about at time. So mm -hmm. I'm. I, I just thought that maybe it's useful for us to to close out by saying, well, first, I mean, Mason, it's always fantastic to chat with you. Um, and also for everyone who's in the audience, um, you know, the two of us are really interested in these issues around AI and accountability. We hope this was an interesting discussion. And it, you know, if if you're thinking about these things and are like, oh, we'd like other people to brainstorm with or chat with, uh, both of us are you know, really passionate about this, this space. Yeah, absolutely. Please reach out if there's, if there's anything uh, we haven't got a chance to discuss that you would like to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, everyone. All right. And thank you to folks at BKC for setting everything up yes. and hosting. You made it very seamless uh, and painless. So thank, and thank you everyone for attending. All right, take care.